and the discussion this evening is Buddhism and Wabi Sabi. And this may seem like a strange combination until you hear the presentation. Um, people, Wabi Sabi is the term that one comes across in Japanese culture that has a plethora of meanings usually associated with a particular type of aesthetic. Its origins are Taoist and Buddhist, and its development in Japan permeates the culture in ways that are both subtle and profound. And so I thought that this evening it would be interesting to discuss wabi-sabi. It's, it is part of Japanese culture, but it is Buddhist-led part of Japanese culture, and it has a broader meaning that um, people normally don't get to when they just look at it from the aesthetic, what they think of as the aesthetic notion. And we'll start with some definitions of wabi-sabi. Some of the most meaningful concepts in both Buddhism and Japanese culture are difficult to describe with words. Many books and articles about wabi-sabi start with the disclaimer that the phrase cannot be explained with words. And tonight I'll use both words and images, not to say that you're necessarily gonna understand um, what wabi-sabi is with words. I think to a very large extent, it really requires living with it. And I'll be interested to get Ichishima Sensei and Job's uh, comments later on how well they think that um, it, both Wabi Sabi is, um, has been defined and how they perceive it from their experiences being Japanese. Wabi literally is, well, I shouldn't say literally because there is no literal translation, but it's often de defined as the elegant beauty of humble simplicity and all things are imperfect. The term wabi only appeared in the 15th century to designate a new aesthetic sensibility closely related to the tea ceremony, which referred to the general atmosphere and to the objects used during this formal service. The definition of wabi can be traced back to the terms loneliness or melancholy, to the appreciation of a serene life far from the urban hus hustle and bustle. Sabi, is the passing of time and subsequent deterioration. All things are impermanent. And so just from this, these two words, you see imperfect and you see impermanent, and you can begin to see the relationship to Buddhism. The second part of the term wabi-sabi-sabi -sabi is said today back to the eighth century when it was used to designate desolation in a poetic way. From the 12th century, the term evolved and referred more, referred more precisely to the delightful contemplation of what is old and warm. It is also used to talk about the beauty of faded or withered things. And sabi could also mean old and elegant or being rusty with an untranslatable impression of peacefulness. Taken together, both Life and art are beautiful, not because they are perfect and eternal, but because they are imperfect and fleeting. Donald Keene observed in a book entitled The Pleasures of Japanese Literature, published in 1988, that the Japanese sense of beauty has long sharply differed from its Western counterpart. It has been dominated by a love of irregularity rather than symmetry, the impermanent rather than the eternal and the simple rather than the ornate. The reason owes nothing to climate or genetics, added King, but as a result of the action of writers, painters, and theorists who had actively shaped the sense of beauty of their nation. For the Japanese people, wabi-sabi is a feeling more than a concept, it's often said. And this can be found in classical Japanese aesthetics, such things as Ikebana, which is flower arrangement, literature, philosophy, poetry, tea ceremonies, Zen gardens, etc. And Wabi Sabi goes against contemporary overconsumption, but also encourages simplicity and authenticity in everything. <clears throat> the origin of concept. 
originating in Taoism during China's Song Dynasty, 960 to 1279. Juniper, the writer, summarizes that wabi-sabi suggests such qualities as impermanence, humility, asymmetry, and imperfection. And these underlying principles are diametrically opposed to their Western counterparts, whose values are rooted in the Hellenic worldview that values permanence, grandeur, symmetry, and perfection. Before being passed into Zen Buddhism, wabi-sabi was originally seen as austere, restrained form of appreciation. It's an intuitive appreciation of a transient beauty in the physical world that reflects the irreversible flow of life in the spiritual world. It is an understated beauty that exists in the modest, rustic, imperfect, or even decayed, an aesthetic sensibility that defines a melancholy melancholic beauty in the impermanence of all things. <clears throat> Buddhist philosophy and wabi-sabi. And we start with the terms sambuin, which in Sanskrit is anitayata, which is impermanence. In Japanese, you will also refer to shogyo mujo. All there is in the world is forever constantly changing. Nothing in the universe is stationary. Our emotions, thoughts, and identity are always flowing in the time continuum. Ku and shunyata, emptiness or absence of self-nature. Shunyata may also be thought of as a physical and mental state that we humans can reach when we feel things just as they are right now in the present period. That is, our minds are not adding anything at all to reality or illuminating anything whatsoever from it. The ego always stands to come between us and reality, leaving no room for shunyata. And the third aspect is mujo or dukkha, suffering and discontentedness. It is the distance that comes between us and something more. We are always wishing for. It is as though we were condemned to want something we cannot have, never to be fully satisfied. This frustration to a greater or a lesser extent is converted into an emptiness inside of us that makes us seek our next objective. And these, of course, are the teachings of the three seals of existence, which is common to all aspects of Buddhism. One cannot discuss wabi-sabi without a brief excursion into chado or chan, chanoyu, the tea ceremony. Chado literally means the the way of tea. The tradition of serving powdered green tea was introduced to Japan from China in the 12th century. And Japanese Buddhist priests who traveled to China to study religious scriptures returned to their homeland having acquired new customs. The priest Issei, 1141 to 1215 CE, was a Tendai monk and founder of the Rinzai Zen Buddhist sect. And he's credited with bringing to Japan the practice of drinking tea in its powdered form. Powdered green tea became an important feature of the monastic tradition and was used as an aid for staying alert during long periods of meditation. From its origin in Zen ceremonies, the cultural practice known as Chanoyu emerged in its secular form during the 5th, 15th, and 16th centuries. A succession of tea masters were instrumental in the development of Zen. Priest Marata Shuko from 1422 to 1502, who was responsible for formalizing the tradition in accordance with Zen ideals. Takano Jo'o, 1503 to 1555, refined the art. And Senbiku, 1521 to 1591 CE, who established the form of Chanyo as it is known today. And the guiding principles of Chanyo as expressed by Senbiku are harmony, between guests, hosts, nature, and setting, respect, 
sincerity toward another, regardless of rank or status, purity, to spiritually cleanse oneself, to be of a pure heart and mind, and finally, tranquility, inner peace that results from obtaining the first three principles. And this inner peace allows one to truly share. In addition to these principles, the essence of Kanyu is embodied in the concept of Ichigo Ichie, literally one time, one meeting. This is the awareness that each tea gathering, that is the, the leaves that are gathered from the plant, is a once in a lifetime event, never to occur again. For this reason, the sharing of a bowl of tea should be conducted with humble nature and utmost sincerity. Sensei, it's too bad that uh, Genshin couldn't have <laughs> watched this this evening. When we look at the wabi-sabi aesthetics exemplified by Chado, we begin with the chanwa, which is the tea bowl. These are normally hand-thrown, and many of these bowls are hundreds of years old revered for their age and the craftsperson who created them. There's then usually, or I shouldn't say usually, always found ikibana. This is always seasonal and it's changed to reflect the people attending the ceremony, the, the chado, as well as the type of day and the environment that it's in. And this is like pottery, the ikibana, it's an art in and of itself. And then there's usually placed in the Tekonoma, a raised alcove providing a very special space in which important items are displayed, such as a gibana, bonsai, a favorite piece of pottery, or an artistic or calligraphic scroll. And so here we see a picture of a scroll that would normally be present at a tea ceremony. And especially when we think of wabi-sabi, we think of the architecture and the architecture of the tea room. This is often a small room, four to six tatami mats, which is about 24 to 36 square feet in size, with a small opening in which the participants must literally crawl into the room to demonstrate the equality and humility. And they do this through a very low, small door. And I suspect that white door in the back of this picture may be the room, the door that they would come in through. With no furniture, it does not have a, it does have a Takonoma with the three elements, usually several Zabutan for the participants to sit on, which are the cushions, the burner, the teapot, ta tea bowls, and, and other implements. These elements are held together by the seasonality and their presentation, demonstrating the ephemeral and permanent nature of existence. The orderliness and discipline of the Chanayu is punctuated by the perfect that is observed in the irregularity, asymmetry, and care of the aged implements and the surroundings. And one should realize that these elements of the tea ceremony are also accompanied by many other elements, which I won't go into a great deal of detail, but the idea of the kaiseki, which many people are aware of, uh, is a type of art form that balances the taste, texture, appearance, and colors of food. As a matter of fact, there's one type of kaiseki known as yori kaiseki, which is the monk's uh, meal, and cha kaiseki, which is the kaiseki of the uh, tea ceremony. Only fresh seasonal ingredients are used and are prepared in a way that aim to enhance their flavor. The term literally means breast pocket stone. I was sort of surprised to find this. I really didn't know what kaiseki meant literally. And these kanji are thought to have been incorporated by Sen no Dikyu to indicate the frugal meal served in the austere style of chandu. Chanuyu, uh, the, the tea ceremony. The idea came from the practice where monks would ward off hunger by putting warm stones into the front folds of the robes near their stomachs. Waka and other forms of Japanese poetry is another example of the aesthetic that you would find associated with Chado, but also that you'll find with Wabi Sabi. And that gained renown in Japan, originating with Buddhist monks and the court. Let's look at, I want to look at one example outside the tea ceremony that in some ways is still related to the tea ceremony. <clears throat> and that's Kintsuji. And K 
Kintsuji is the art of repairing broken pottery by mending the areas of breakage with lacquer dusted with mixed or powdered gold, silver, or platinum. And the method is similar to what's known as the Maka'e te technique. And in this cup, you can see that the gold lines there are where a cup which has been smashed, not intentionally, but just dropped you know, through use, has been repaired using the Kintsuji uh, technique. As a philosophy, it treats breakage and repair as part of the history of an object rather than something to disguise. Kintsugi became closely associated with ceramic vessels used for Chanuyu, the CT ceremony. And as a philosophy, Kintsugi can be seen to have similarities to the Japanese philosophy of wabi-sabi. An embracing of the flawed or the imperfect. Japanese aesthetics values marks of wear by the use of an object. This can be seen as rationale for keeping an object around even after it's been broken and as a justification of Kintsugi itself. Highlighting the cracks and repairs as simply an event in the life of an object rather than allowing its service to end at the time of its damage or breakage. Kintsugi can relate to the Japanese philosophy of no mind, mushin, which encompasses the concepts of non-attachment, acceptance of change and fate as aspects of human life. And as a way of approaching the world. The first is don't be too hard on others, on yourself and others. You've heard me refer to Dr. Shomo, Shoma Morita, contemporary of Freud's and the creator of Morita therapy, who was influenced by Buddhism. He stated the following, give up on yourself, begin taking action now while being neurotic or imperfect or a procrastinator or, un or unhealthy or lazy or any other label by which you have inaccurately described yourself. Go ahead and be the best imperfect person you can be and get started on those things you want to accomplish before you die. This is a rather wabi-sabi statement. None of us live in an objective world, but instead a subjective world. And we ourselves have given meaning to this world. The world you see is different from the one I see, and it's impossible to share your world with anyone else. And this is by Kashimi. And this is relevant in the sphere of friendships and even more so when it comes to couples. Apart from being useless, hoping that our friends will meet our expectations is a surefire path to loneliness since we will get upset with them one by one and end up losing them. Expressions like, if I were you, I would have done this or that when we feel let down because we're hoping for a different response from them. And the reality encapsulates a profound ignorance of the individuality of the human condition. The wabi-sabi of love implies loving those characteristics that make the person unique and only altering by mutual consent what jeopardizes the bond. And in conclusion, the demands of modern life try to push, up, push us to be perfect. We're expected to achieve success, make money, and become popular on social networks, constantly improve following the advice of internet books and self-help gurus. And that is where the danger lies. If we become obsessed with perfecting our lives, we will end up full of things we desire, if we're lucky, arrogant and heartless, without space to learn the truly important things of life. Are we to look at cherry blossoms only in full bloom, at the moon only when it is cloudless? Branches about to bloom or gardens strewn with faded flowers are worthy of our admiration. From the Essays in Idleness by Kenko Yoshida. In other words, all stages and conditions of nature are beautiful and worthy of our attention, contemplation, and affection. Wabi-sabi was born of Taoism, further rooted in Buddhism and is expressed through aesthetics, form, and function. 
philosophy and a way of life. It is the manifestation of what we attempt to approach as Buddhists living in a more complete and wholesome world. The primary lessons are that everything is imperfect, impermanent, and incomplete in nature, and we as humans are part of nature. Examining wabi-sabi is a meditation on shunyata. And these are some of the materials that I used, although I didn't go into detail. I wanted to talk about the praise of shadows by Tanizaki, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about Ikebana. Um, but in fact, and, and certainly essays and idleness, there's a lot to, to plumb from that source. Um, but in order to keep it relatively short, I had to go beyond discussing that this evening. And now I'm going to unmute everyone and see what questions and comments you might have. Hold on just a moment. Okay, there we go. And let me ask Joe Benichi Shima Sensei, did, did that makes did that make sense to you? <laughs> Being yes. Japanese? Yeah, this is a very uh, concept of Japanese uh, classics, and uh, still uh, you can see in the uh, Chanoyu uh, way of tea or and uh, flower arrangement, etc. That uh, is, uh, I think, uh, representing wabi and sabi, and especially uh, as you mentioned in in your presentation, Okakura Tenshin, who wrote the Book of Tea. This is a guidebook to Japanese culture, according to my friend, who uh, uh, Professor Weinstein. Uh, he it, uh, always introducing Japanese culture using uh, Okakura Tenshin's the Book of Tea. That is very famous in the United States of America, she said. Is that okay? Do, yes. Do you, yes, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Joe, what is, what is your impression? Yeah, it's a beautiful presentation. Uh, uh, let me make two, two observations, uh, share with you two observations. Uh, I think, as you said, while oftentimes people uh, think that the sense of wabi-sabi goes back to Taoism, I think, as you said, uh, it actually uh, is better seen as an integration of Taoism and Buddhism. And oftentimes people use the following analogy, perhaps many of you know, um, to explain the sense of wabi-sabi um, and the analogy of uh, vinegar tasters, uh, right? Um, uh, once Confucius and the Buddha and the Lao Tzu, they tasted vinegar <coughs> and the Confucius said, this is sour. And the Buddha said, this is bitter. And then Lao Tzu said, this is sweet. <laughs> so uh, wabi-sabi is in a way, right, uh, to appreciate the beauty and the sweetness of um, ever-changing nature of reality. But at the same time, I would say that it's, it's not just sweetness, but it's a bitter sweetness. So it's an integration of Buddhism and Taoism, mm -hmm. and not just uh, Taoism. Mm -hmm. The second point I, I wanted to mention was, uh, I think we can tie the sense of or the cultivation of the sense of uh, wabi-sabi to the practice of uh, makashikan or shikan, sh shikan meditation. Um, we know that uh, 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 such, such uh, uh, Japanese poet masters as uh, Fujiwara no Shunzei from the third, uh, 12th century, he actually used the uh, chigi's uh, makashikan to cultivate the sense of wabi-sabi otherwise known as the ineffable uh, you again. So I would say that the cultivation of the sense of wabi-sabi can be understood as a practice of neither walking nor sitting meditation. Well, thank you. Thank you, Joe. What questions might we have this evening? <clears throat> Toshin, and you're muted, but okay. 
Um, is there a sense uh, that um, you can't force Swabi Sabi? No, you can't. <laughs> Absolutely. But, but, I, but, people, but people try, right? I mean, the, 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 the aesthetic, I guess the aesthetic. Of I, I think people try to do it with the aesthetic. An, an example that I, I'd seen referenced in, in one of the books on Wabi Sabi that I, I'd read, I don't remember which one it was, and, and it deals with it in the more contemporary period. Um, and it, it talked about the person who wanted to create a Wabi Sabi kitchen. So they went into the kitchen, they took sandpaper and started sanding randomly their, their cabinets to give it a, a less perfect appearance, thinking that somehow that was going to make the kitchen seem more wabi-sabi and then using uh, plain wooden beams, you know, uh, highlighting the beams in the kitchen, that sort of thing. That would be trying to force what is wabi-sabi. Wabi-sabi occurs because of time and the deterioration of the materials as well as, and that, that's not to say that one therefore ignores the building. I mean, I, I'm not going to not paint our hondo with the intention of creating a wabi-sabi looking building <laughs> because then it would, then it would lose its function, <laughs> you know, and wabi-sabi is really, maintaining the function while something has been aging and, and in some ways deteriorating. So it's impermanence and imperfection uh, at the same time. You, you might attempt to do something like that, but it's probably not going to be too successful. First Job and then Seichi. Now, apropos, uh, the question's comment, uh, um, you know, not supposed to force, right, uh, Wabi Sabi. When we, my family visited the, the Tenda Institute, we cleaned Right, and, <laughs> and 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 I debated with my, my one of my kids how much to clean the statue of Saicho, because it was you know it required cleaning, but if you clean too much, it loses wabi sabi. <laughs> <laughs> A good example, thank you, Joe, and thank you for not cleaning it too much. <laughs> <laughs> Say, yes. uh, does wabi sabi always have a material component? No, no, it can it can also have something which is which is non-material. Yes, um, uh, well, I thought that's what Joda, uh, um, what uh, Jodo meant when he said about meditation. So, my yeah. mind kind of went to, for example, Tai Chi, where there can be a wabi sabi component, either deliberate or just happens because of for some other reason. Uh, and I wondered if that if, if I was making a kind of correct analogy there. Well, for instance, uh, there, there's, um, you find some of Basho's poetry being uh, very mm -hmm. wabi-sabi in its, in its uh, nature. Mm -hmm. um, Waka in general would be, you know, further examples of that. So, and, and I, I think that aside from Joe, Job's comment about uh, Shikan, uh, and that being the, the wabi-sabi is the not sitting or standing. Mm -hmm. I think that there are types of meditation that we do that really bring out a sense of when you're doing something on shunyata, I think that that is a type of wabi-sabi meditation quite often. Yeah. And, and if I'm, and I'm really sorry, Mushin, I, I, and I, because I want to relate that to the Narita, um, the, um, the Narita's, comment. yeah, by Marita. Yeah, yeah, that, that comment that of, of, and I guess that's maybe what my question was about enforcing um, that mm -hmm. concept of acceptance and allowing, um, right, without without effort, I guess. Or without, yeah, and, and and I'll just comment on that, and then and I'll get right to you, Mushin. And I'll just comment on that, and that is that Marita's idea was that part of what his therapy was based upon is the idea of letting the person really just be. And, and the person is literally in bed for a week without having conversation, without having uh, much interaction, just eating very simple meals, and then slowly getting into uh, daily activities, doing things like sweeping the room and that sort of thing. Um, and the, the uh, therapist would come by once a day and just to say, 
to say hello, not to do any analysis or anything like this, just to let it be, not to force something, to allow the person to, through contemplation, to begin to uncover materials. Now, that would be an example. Mushin, you had your hand up before. Yes. Uh, would you consider the old Hondo in the horse barn sort of wabi sabi? <laughs> Without a doubt. <laughs> that was a perfect really, example. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and it's interesting because in the new in the new Hondo, we took the elements from that barn, yeah. mm-hmm. although we cleaned them and we used them again. Yeah. Um, and and I think that they still have a sort of a wabi sabi appearance. Um, it, it comes naturally after 250 years of being a barn. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yes, Toby. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, there's something so interesting about this. I'm I'm so happy to hear this talk tonight, and the conversation is really wonderful. Um, I was thinking about how the um, the spiritual and philosophical notions. Um, sort of gave birth to styles historically. So something that um, techniques, I guess I could say, um, where where uh, the aging of the object or the the um, essence isn't necessarily the um, the way that something arrives at uh, at a roughness. So I'm thinking of um, Raku wear or the roughness of uh, Sumie uh, calligraphy or something yeah. like that, um, that um, we can um, make new, but, it, but it's a technique that, um, that brings forth that ineffable that, um, that um, Job was talking about. And I, I just love this 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 quality that's sort of the betweenness but it's not forced which is wonderful that you use that word even though you, you've retracted it a bit in that um even with raku wear where they make these these um the ceramic they don't know how it's going to come out <laughs> so they uh, un, unpack it from the the uh, the matter that they've stuffed it with and then these things have occurred nat- naturally, and um, so I I love that I- idea. Where I- I'm actually really happy that he brought up the word um, forcing because um, it arrives <laughs> in that way. So yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, and it's great to see you tonight, Tommy. Put your hand up, Joshin. Yes. Um... When Tomie was speaking, I, I, I kind of had my thought together, but I think just seeing her uh, brought, brought my question. We, we've been um, talking about all these wabi-sabi um, objects, and, I, and it occurs to me that, you know, it's, it's mostly appealing to our sense of vision. And I'm wondering, I'm thinking of to, uh, Tomie playing for us so beautifully. I'm wondering if there's like, um, any sense of wabi sabi in the music or the the instruments? Could that could that ha- be? I, I think without a doubt, shakuhachi is is a perfect example yeah. of a wabi sabi instrument. I mean, compare that to something like a violin. By contrast, um, mm-hmm. so I, I think without without a doubt that that especially shakuhachi. I mean. <laughs> I, I think of some of the other Japanese uh, chord instruments that are very refined and very symmetrical, et cetera, whereas the shakuhachi is a, a natural, has a natural essence to it. And the sound that's coming from it is a sound that is, doesn't have the same regularity that some of the other instruments might have. <clears throat> mm-hmm. I feel differently about that, Tome, but that's my personal. Uh, okay. Uh, Wynn, you, had, you have your... Yeah, I, I was just thinking as we get into these other art forms of uh, buto, the dance or movement form, mm-hmm. and also of no theater, uh, N O H, and uh, uh, so that I think there it, there's uh, an incredibly beautiful consistency across 
all of these things. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting how you mentioned those two forms, no and buto. Buto, I think, is very wabi-sabi. I'm not sure that no is because mm, no, I, yeah. has, no has a regularity to it and yeah. uniformity, et cetera. Whereas buto is a, is a, as an art form, uh, mm. a form of dance, a form of performance Definitely. that is um, rough, rugged, uh, mm. but in a, in a very positive way. I'm not saying that in a, in a, mm. in a negative way, but that's what is attractive about it is that sense of, of roughness and rawness that you see mm. in buto. Uh, and, and I think that that's true with Wabi Sabi in general. There's a sense of, taking something which may be very refined to begin with, but over time becomes something else. Um, and so it's that impermanence mm. that's part of that. Yes, Gary. Uh, to talk about the visual art for a bit, um, I think that uh, American abstract expressionism really uh struck a chord with Japan and uh, Japanese artists. And we have a, a, a lot of work uh, out of that kind of spontaneity. And uh, as Pollock said, I am nature. You know, it's not I'm making pictures of nature, but I am nature. And um, I think that also Rauschenberg, uh, what I'm trying to talk about is, uh, is this, this is not, a something that is restricted to uh, Asian or, or Buddhist or Japanese thinking, uh, this notion of uh, some kind of uh, appreciation of the war in the past, the idiosyncratic, the accidental. Um, a lot of that has been explored uh, in, in work after 1945 in America. Well, and, and I think that probably what is different about it um, is that it didn't become a kind of genre in and of itself. Right. And you're mentioning Pollock or whomever. And I don't disagree with what you're saying at all. I, I think that you don't have to be Japanese to see Wabi Sabi or to appreciate Wabi Sabi. Hmm. But I think that it, in Japan, it reached a kind of fluorescence that you, you don't see in the West. Sure. That, that's how I would explain it. Yeah. Yes, sure. Job. And, and Job and then Chody. Yeah, quickly. Um, people usually say that in the West, you don't see so much wabi sabi, but in American art, um, art forms, uh, I see one place where I, I, I see kind, uh, something that resonates with wabi sabi. That's in. Chaplin's movies. Uh. In, in Chaplin's <laughs> movies, you see bittersweetness, whereby he tries to um, reveal some profound aspect of life. And and I and I would I would even go further and say that that one of the thing one of the characteristics of Wabi Sabi is a sense of melancholy. And that's the bittersweetness that you were talking about about before, Joe. And so I think that that is is present uh, in that the the Chaplin esque uh, mm -hmm. approach. Yeah, Chodin, you had your hand up. Yes. Uh, can we think that maybe uh, wabi sabi is an expression of tathata, of suchness? I think that one can say that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, Wabi Sabi is very uh, expressing the simplicity uh, and also equalities. In the at the time of the uh, what should I say, uh, w uh, middle uh, Japanese, uh, I think samurai etc. The ranking there, you see, or higher or lower, but the, uh, everybody when they come into the room of tea, then everybody is equal. Excuse me, I, I have a guess, just a, uh, I'll leave. Okay, okay, Sensei. So what, what Sensei was saying was I was talking about the small door that one enters for the uh, uh, chado for the ceremony. Uh, and you literally, sometimes it's, I mean, 
having gone to tea ceremony through those doors, literally, you know, I'm not a super big guy, but I'm large enough. So it was difficult to get into the, into the opening because you've got to really go on your hands and knees or even down further to go through the door. And the idea is that by doing that, everyone is entering equally. So it expresses a sense of equality. So it doesn't matter whether you're the largest landowner in the, in the area or you're one of the people who is um, working for the landowner, you all come in equally. Mm. So that, I think that's what, what Ichishima Sensei was trying to, was trying to get at. Yeah. Are there any other questions or comments? No? Okay. Well, I hope you, I hope you appreciate the presentation. It's a little bit, Different yes. and oh, maybe maybe since I have something else, would you oh. like to complete what you're saying before? Oh yes, yeah. Uh, you see, uh, at the uh, warriors uh, samurai in the medieval time of Japan, they have uh, you know uh, many <clears throat> weapons, etc. But they they have to leave their sword before entering into the tea room, so that uh, you know the in the tea room. Uh, everybody is equal and quiet and simple. I think uh, this is uh, very interesting. And also someone mentioned about uh, Raku Jawan. Raku is a very uh, simple, but very uh, deep meanings of maybe human to touch to the ball of Raku Jawan. Uh, Raku tea is, I like very much about that. And uh, so Tiru House is a very good space, like uh, Bimara Kirti mentioned in the, his uh, work. Everybody can join in the very small room, but uh, that small room uh, goes to everywhere. And so everybody can join in such a very small tatami. And I think uh, uh, tea, is really developed as uh, Monshi mentioned in the early part that uh, Esai, uh, he brought such a tea cow to, to Japan. He developed more, uh, what shall I say, esoteric style of Buddhism. Like uh, uh, he developed one of the uh, 18 schools of uh, Taimitsu, uh, Tantric Buddhism in Japan. Uh, and uh, the way of tea is really adapted from that uh, 18-do, 18 manas, table manas like that. Mm -hmm. uh, welcome, when mm, the master welcome the guest, then uh, they really uh, prepare such a very simple flower or incense and uh, so that the uh, guest are uh, easy easily feeling, what shall I say, uh, quiet and uh, safe. Uh, so wabi-sabi is a very interesting uh, expression of Japanese culture, I think. Thank you, thank you. And, and we, I, should, I should comment, uh, Sensei's son, Genshin, yeah. has been studying tea ceremony for how many years now, Sensei? Maybe, more than 10 years, I think. Yeah, yeah, he's a he, he very devoted practitioner, I would say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's one of his practices. So, yes, someone raised their hand, but oh, is that Glenn? Yeah. Yes, yeah, what um, you're saying, um, the person studying the ceremony, what, what lineage or style was it like is it like uh, Urasenke? oh it, his son i don't know which, which what uh yeah, what, Urasenke. Or yes, yes. Urasenke. yes. Yeah. Right. any other questions if not then oh chip go ahead that little room is every house have a little room like that or no is it just certain no certain places those, those are just people that practice tea ceremony. And, and even if you practice tea ceremony, you probably don't have 
a tea room in your house. That that's you know, people who are very devoted might have it, and some people have a small tea house if they have a larger piece of property or something like that. Um, Sensei, are you going to be putting a tea house up at uh, Senzoji? Yeah, we have uh, Yojo Han, four and a half tatami's room, and uh, Nijo Daime, two mm -hmm. tatamis, but very small, but very cozy, uh, friendly atmosphere. Yeah. Just so you know, a tatami is approximately um, six feet long by three feet wide. That'll yeah. give you an idea of how large that is. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mark. Yeah, I just wanted to remark that the larger the person, the more they have to humble themselves to get through that small That's opening. True. So I would think a sumo wrestler may have a very hard time for a large person. <laughs> they really have I, to be humble. To, right? I bet a sumo wrestler couldn't get in. <laughs> <laughs> but it is a kind of equalizer, isn't it, to go through that yeah. door? Yeah. Well, if there are no other questions, I'm going to move along. Um, and I will be muting everyone once again, and we will move along with the service. One step beyond there is darkness, goes a popular Japanese saying, and this contains a great truth which connects to all humans. We prefer the present to the future because we have a false sense that in the here and now, everything is under control. The future causes us fear and uncertainty because we do not know what it will be like. It is outside our control. But the future at some point will become the present. So in reality, the present and the future are outside our control. And it is beautiful and thrilling that it should be so. This is a quote by Suzuki Nobuo in Wabasabi, The Wisdom and Imperfection. And it could have come from any number of Buddhist Shastras. And I think we all struggle to a greater or less extent with the modern world in which we are conflicted about living with the tools and modern paraphernalia around us, and at the same time, trying to live an authentic life. For me, I'm confronted with a laptop computer that looks brand new. I mean, if you saw it, you would say, oh, that's a new computer. But it's now four or five years old. And it's telling me that its design life is coming to an end. As a matter of fact, the manufacturer told me they're no longer supporting it. It's one of those modern conveniences that has a set lifespan. It's not intended to function anymore as a result of new technologies. It is, in fact, designed not to be repaired or renewed. And I think about that in relation to our discussion this evening about the repairing of a simple um, tea ceremony bowl. To me, this is heartbreaking. We have so many implements of our modern life that are like this, refrigerators or automobiles, et cetera. It's even more heartbreaking because we, Schumann and myself, and our Sangha are focusing on living a life that is more environmentally committed. I don't have any words of wisdom that will transform this challenge into a solution. I only have stopgap measures, which I hope will mitigate the damages. We must be content to do our best and to allow our Buddhist teachings to permeate our lives in hopes that we will find solutions one step at a time. So I look at the wabi-sabi nature of the changing of the seasons, the aging and patina developing in our beloved condo, and in the fountain pen that I have had for 35 years and still write with, not because it's better at the task than a disposable ballpoint, but because it provides me with a sense of reality. Many years ago, I saw wabi-sabi in action. There were a group of us, approximately 12, from the Buddhist, from the Tendai Buddhist Institute, who had taken a trip to Japan and toured Japan. And the Jigyodan, who supports our, our temple here, was very gracious in assisting us in the process. And we had just gone to Asakusa Sensoji Temple 
and which is the largest temple in Tokyo. And it's, it happens to be uh, associated with Tendai. And they have a beautiful garden there, not the Zen garden that you would imagine at some of the uh, uh, rock, you know, the, the stone gravel gardens, but it's a, a more, uh, it's a garden filled with trees and a pond and, and various types of foliage. And it was, it was autumn. And so we were touring the garden and, and we're touring it when most people wouldn't be permitted, but because of we're a, a Tendai organization, we were given permission to, to go and tour the garden at that time. And one of the younger monks had been raking all the leaves uh, from the fallen trees and he Beautiful job. Everything was picked up. Everything was absolutely spotless. And then as we're watching, as we're going along, walking along the trail in the garden, right in the middle of, of Tokyo, you'd never know that you're in the middle of the city. We're walking along, and we're watching him finishing his, his raking, and then he goes and shakes a tree so that leaves would fall naturally on the ground. And that was a sense of wabi-sabi, to take that which was perfect, it was completely um, swept, and then just shake the tree to introduce that little bit of imperfection so that the leaves would then decompose in that space. Well, moments like that can transform or can form into an indelible impression on us. If we allow the moment to transform our consciousness and our imagination, embrace such moments, rebel cynicism, repel cynicism, and feel the joy available at any given instant. To Taoism, that which is absolutely still or absolutely perfect is absolutely dead. For without the possibility of growth and change, there can be no Tao. In reality, there is nothing in the universe which is completely perfect or completely still. It is only in the minds of humans that such concepts exist. And this is a quote by Alan Watts.